James Lindsay, uh, thank you so much for joining us on Miriam West. Um, this might be um, some mixed media time for you because your new book is out, if I'm correct. That's right. Well, it's almost out. It's very confusing as to whether it's out or not because of the pandemic. So um, what had happened was it was supposed to be out in June and then all the printing presses shut down completely. And so they're all backed up. And so we were given a tentative date at, near the end of August. But once the print runs have been completed, it'll start going out. So we have no idea for sure when it'll go out. It may be as early as next week. So it's very soon to come out. Yeah, because I got a note from publisher that the book is out and ready for review. So I'm assuming you are, you know, engaging sometime from now on to the media related to the book. All the time. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, we, we'll get back to book later or maybe another time. But uh, I wanted to start talking to you about the, the environment that we are in, um, especially in last three or four weeks. Uh, I had a conversation recently with Bo Weingart, um, and he he said, you know, he, in all honesty, he said, I'm terrified at what I'm seeing right now. Um, what is your assessment? Do you agree that it's a terrifying time that we are in right now? Yes. Uh, this, uh, I keep trying to tell people that um, this one is the real thing. This is an attempted revolution. Uh, it's an attempted revolution of the way our society operates and the way our society functions all the way down to the ways that we validate statements as being true and false. We can what we consider is is knowledge and what is not knowledge, uh, what we will be willing to promote or employ or uh, allow to have sway or function in society. So this is I don't know how fully hearted it is, but this is an attempt at a social and cultural and political revolution. And uh, I would say the United States, but it's genuinely across, I think, all of all of the world, except for maybe East Asia, to be honest with you, um, it seems. Um, I don't think all of the world. I think most of the Western European I see because of the media affiliation, I think they're there. For example, I closely monitor and follow um, uh, um, news environment. For example, in Middle East, there's right. nothing like that. You don't. You don't yeah, there. right, right. Because you know the basic freedom is not there. So you know why bother even right. uh, to go after that? Um, right. But you know China, I I think it was always the same. I, I don't see much of a difference right. over there. East Asian countries. I mean, Japan. I don't know. Korea. I have no idea. But right. um, what strikes me most is you know. You know, Europe, Western Europe countries, I mean, some kind of a semi quasi socialism, you know, it has its own identity politics problem and it's, they have it in their own history. But right. why it's now waving this much um, in a fearful way in the United States? Um, so this is actually the the tip of of the iceberg of a very deep problem that's been brewing mostly not entirely but mostly within within our university systems for at least 50 years maybe longer uh very prominently since the 1970s at least within its you know taking over of the the university systems slowly at first and then more rapidly in the past maybe decade or so um in the 1970s late 1960s into the 1970s is when you started to see a set of, of academic disciplines arising, such as ethnic studies, African-American studies, women's studies, gender studies, masculinity studies, and they kind of have all the same flavor, you know, something identity studies or something to do with identity theory, critical race theory, queer theory, post-colonial theory. Um, you see like me, feminist media studies, feminist studies, just this whole identity politics kind of uh, intellectual architecture that's been being built in our academies for, like I said, since the late 1960s and early 1970s. And these departments have either received very little or acknowledged even less of the criticism that they've been given from other departments or from scholars outside of their, their departments. And they don't particularly criticize themselves, not in their main uh, kind of vision or thrust. They criticize themselves endlessly in terms of, of deepening their commitment to their their 
ideological vision, but they never criticize that ideological vision itself, just how they're failing to manifest it. And so this has grown and, and taken on various aspects of, of different intellectual currents throughout that entire history. Uh, it was very radical, often Marxist or materialist or socialist in its original formulations. Uh, then in the late 18, uh, 1980s and early 1990s, it started to take up postmodern theory, which started to gain high fashion in the humanities departments of universities. And when it equipped itself with postmodern theory, it gave itself the ability to deny the idea of, object of objective truth or objective standards, with that in law, be that in science, philosophy, and to defer instead to the uh, lived experience of individuals, because it combined with this earlier critical method of identity politics, the lived experience of systemic oppression became its core object. And that's now matured. Uh, that was, you know, 30 or so years ago, and it is now matured and reached a point where that scholarship now has a great deal of confidence. It's been simplified and put into practice by multiple generations of activists now who have tested it in the real world against people to see what is convincing to them. And it has used the emergence of social media and the current events that are happening in order to propel itself into the mainstream, um, particularly the Black Lives Matter movement for, for the critical race theory aspect, both in 2014-15 uh, going forward. And then particularly once Donald Trump uh, was started to run for president, theory was given as the explanation for how Donald Trump's presidency could be possible. Um, just to kind of close that thought, the reason is because theory posits that basically everybody in society, the entire structure of society in a very um, kind of Marx superstructure sense is all built out of systems of oppression like racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, ableism. You can just, uh, Judith Butler, one of their scholars, in fact, called it that exasperated, et cetera, when you try to list all of them and that those things are hidden. People hide them but they really feel them and they really reproduce them so that they're they're just beneath the surface. And so theory interpreted Donald Trump's run for president and then his eventual election and then the behavior and defenses that he's seen uh, since taking office so th as, as proof that those hidden, the, they keep saying the mask has slipped, that the society really is racist, society really is misogynist, and now it's willing to just come out and say so, whereas it was hiding it behind a nice face before that. So the circumstances have enabled it to really push its narrative. And I mean, some people call it Trump derangement syndrome uh, has given it quite the uh, viral power within our society to, to be taken up and be pushed to every corner of everything. Well, from the look of it and, and, and how you portray it, um, it's looked like a, some kind of a Loch Ness monster seeing, sighting, um, you know, everyone says, you know, it's not there, but it's happening or so. How come that, you know, from academic, from ac from academics to uh, mainstream media, uh, how is that everyone, especially in the United States, which is a meritocracy capitalism for many years, and, and, and you know, the, the success of the United States goes to that uh, found the foundation. How, even, even in the last 30 years, this, you know, in academics, these people were, getting funding from the capitalist, capitalist system that feed them on to come here. How, how can they come up with this kind of an outreach now and, 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 and just make it, make it so um, dominant now that you, you can even not have a conversation with someone, the same conversation with someone? Right. So a, f a couple or a few things happened along the path of what I was just describing that enabled it to mainstream. Um, there is, of course, the, the reliance on the public mood being such that uh, they would be susceptible to this. Partly, I described the role that Donald Trump's election played. But we could also talk about um, percep perception, at least on the left, whatever the reality is. I know my friends on the right disagree with this, but the perception on the left has been that for many years now, beginning particularly with, with Reagan and moving forward, so again, that's 40 years ago, uh, that the right wing has been systemically squashing the middle class. It's been enriching the, the, the richest in society and creating great wealth disparity 
and it is not taking care of the working class. It's not taking care of the middle class like it used to, and that this is a tremendous injustice. And it, of course, impacts uh, groups that they define as marginalized, racially mar marginalized or sexually marginalized groups the most because a hard economy is hardest on the people with the fewest opportunities and resources to participate in it. So for a number of years, at least the last decade, the and really longer, the left side of the United States' is kind of socio-political milieu has been very, very sensitive and angry about the way that, you know, we are not sufficiently progressive. And I think it used to be a much more reasonable argument, but the the pitch has increased as they felt more and more like their uh, their hopes, I will say, weren't being met. And the hopes as they continued to not be met started to turn into demands. Now, to understand how this would be possible, it's important to realize that, like I said, these currents started in the 19. 60s and 70s. Well, one of the dimensions that I didn't mention was in particular what's called critical pedagogy, which started to arise in the 1970s. Pedagogy is the theory of education. So it's how we teach. It's how we teach teachers to teach um, in particular. And so coming out of the, out of the or early 1970s, you had a Brazilian educator who my Brazilian friends tell me wrecked Brazilian education called Paulo Freire. And Paulo Freire was a post-Marxist. He blamed the education system, uh, said that it was built on capitalist premises. He called it the banking model of education and was quite revolutionary. He was famous for making the statement that a, a, a revolution is only uh, authentic so long as it stays revolutionary, because as soon as it stops being revolutionary, it becomes the status quo that needs to be overthrown. So he was quite the revolutionary thinker um, in kind of the most literal sense of that term. And his work became very popular with a rash of North American educators, Michael Apple, Ira Shore, in particular Henry Giroux, in the late 1970s going into the early 1980s. Henry Drew was very influential with his, his first book, his first big book, which was published in 1981. And so very rapidly, our education system started to bend toward the critical, which tries to teach teachers, to teach students, to see themselves in an oppressed situation. So they would start teaching things like Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States in place of regular US history, or in as, at first as a, as a you know, a supplement to regular US history. And all along, the goal is to start to teach people to dislike the foundations of the country, to see the unfairnesses that occurred, to, to manipulate that guilt and shame. And while some of the criticism is certainly fair, much of it was unfair, uh, a critical historiography is meant to tell just the ugly side of the story, to manipulate emotions. It's not a fair portrayal of history. History is not a pretty story. It's just how it is. So you can very easily do that. And they've had the colleges of education more or less under their control since the mid-1980s. And many of the school systems so are... are We've now had at least one generation, but more likely three generations of students coming out of uh, our, our primary and secondary education systems who have been fed a very heavy diet of, of radical skepticism in the foundational principles of American civics and economics. And so they become a very, very ripe audience for these narratives that are coming around the political struggles that have, of course, the media has been, and, and just the politicians themselves have been ratcheting those up. I think every election of my lifetime has been the election that's going to change the war. You know, everything depends on it. It's the most important election in history. Every one of them for the, I'm, you know, 41 years old, every election in my lifetime has been the most important election in history, apparently. And uh, there, there's a lot of ratcheting up of this emotion. And there's been a lot of fertile ground laid through our education system to get people ready for this. And of course, the other aspect is if you educate journalists in this and all of the all of the courses that would teach you critical theory, critical theory by definition has to contain an element of social activism. So you don't just train somebody to be a critical educator. You have to teach them that a, a core part of being a critical educator is being an activist and training activists. You don't just train somebody in critical journalism. You tell them that becoming an activist, a critical theory activist, is part of critical journal journalism. So they have to become journalists who are activists as well, or activist journalists. Scholars have to become activist scholars. Educators have to become activist educators. And so there's been this very long kind of slow push 
to increase the amount of activism in essentially every domain of cultural production. So media, education, arts, faith, um, whatever else counts as, as being cultural production. And it's taught this message that social activism uh, against the unfairness of a biased society is an absolutely necessary moral good. So that gave a lot of fertile ground so that when people started to feel economically squeezed, especially following the recession with, with George W. Bush, uh, the end of his presidency, uh, and then very little feel, very much feeling, I should say, on the left that the Republican Party was actively resisting Obama's attempts to, to do better by that situation. Um, when, you, when you have that, it foments a lot of grievance. It foments a lot of anger. It, it enhances and makes credible those arguments that America sucks. And all it takes is the right event, say, in this case, the uh, killing of George Floyd in the right environment, which is a society going crazy on the left, at least, because Donald Trump is such an aberrant president in terms of at least of his manner. Uh, he's not acting like a normal president would act. Whatever his policies are is, is fine. He's not a normal character for the office. And so the stress finally just burst loose and uh, it's it's seizing its moment very effectively. Going back to this last um, 30, 40 years um, that, you know, you addressed uh, things within, you know, being um, seated in the in academia and in, in, in universities. Um, this question comes to mind, why there wasn't no, you know, alarm or, or, or why, why, why it was not noticed or if it, if it was noticed, why, why it wasn't heard enough. So that, that part of it, because it goes 30 or 40 years, it's, it's a little bit, um, you know, um, it's, it's unsettling to how did it go without detection or was it a detection? We didn't point this it. So just, Give me a, how, how do you view on this? I think it was detected to some degree. It's kind of very complicated. Certainly the right wing has detected it. And um, unfortunately, the way they responded seemed a bit histrionic and um, over the top early on, especially, you know, where, where the answer to this problem was suddenly supposed to be Rush Limbaugh and um, whatever Bill O'Reilly on Fox News and this, this what appeared to be very clearly biased uh, kind of news media echo chamber system of, of right wing media that was trying to tell some of this story. But of course, following the usual rule of thumb of political science, that the more political something is perceived to be, the less credible it's treated, people just discounted this. Uh, so the right wing was certainly trying to raise the alarm. From what I'm told by my friends on the right, their solutions were never particularly good. It was all this circle the wagon, school choice, blah, 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 which didn't address the root causes of the problem. Um, it doesn't matter if you choose, you can choose whatever school you want if all the educators are being educated in the same way. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one you pick. And if you are gonna be certified as a teacher, you have to go through one of these programs. Critics on the left arose, but they were mostly either bullied or silenced, or in, in truth, there were a lot of criticisms, say specifically of critical race theory written in the 1990s in law journals. And they all said the same thing, that it's completely uh, uncreditable. Um, excellent takedowns were written of it, and then they were just ignored. And they said the same thing over and over again, that it hasn't really left academia, so nobody cares. I mean, I think we underestimate how much people in general believe that academia is essentially like a country in Narnia that doesn't even have anything to do with the real world. You have to go through some magic wardrobe and kids go to college there and screw off for five years and professors, you know, do whatever it is they do. Yeah, it's like going to Hogwarts. Uh, you have to, it's just some, it's like a different world that doesn't really apply to reality. And a lot of people perceive that about academia, but they at, at their peril. So the criticisms within academia weren't taken very seriously. People who criticized it were few and far between. And then when they did criticize it, everybody kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, well, it's just this weird backwater that doesn't seem to have any influence on reality. So who cares? Let them do what they want to do. And then there's the aspect that if you did criticize it effectively, you would get accused of having racist motivations for having done so or wanting to silence black voices or wanting to silence women as the, the feminist side of it would have gone. And 
this created a set of incentives that make no sense for criticizing it or trying to, to address the problem. So imagine you are maybe an economist or whatever, and you look at this and you think, what is this stuff? Are you going to criticize it? Well, you're a faculty member. You have your own work you want to work on that's in economics. Your department's not really going to give you any award for trying to clean up some weird backwater over there. You might get a paper out of it. The paper isn't going to count much for your own academic purposes. Um, it's just there's no real incentive to do it. And then at the same time, you know, especially going into the 2000s, when you started to get these diversity, inclusion and equity offices coming up, that if you were to challenge it, you might get dragged in front of the diversity board. So now you have to go through this humiliating hearing and your, your colleagues are going to doubt your moral character and the accusations that you're complicit in racism or sexism or homophobia or whatever are going to come. So the incentives are stacked completely against trying to criticize it. There's there's almost no incentive to do so. And it's just kind of like kicking a hornet's nest is even the phrase we've all been using for a long time. And who wants to get stung by bees when, the, you know, there's no incentive for getting rid of the bees. But like, in, I mean, the reality is that you do have a hornet's nest kind of in your yard. You it doesn't matter that nobody's going to come give like the fire department's not going to come give you an award for heroism for knocking it down. But if you don't, you still have a yard full of hornets. And so the incentive structures weren't there professionally or economically and have gotten far worse. And so there was no reason to, to criticize it because doing the right thing with no kind of material incentive is um, very difficult because these are, you know, abstract hornets, at least until recently. So they didn't really have stingers and you know, they just annoyed you. And now, there are some stingers. So there was a massive re set of, of kind of structural, if you will, to use their language, uh, incentives against criticizing it. And so it was able to continue to grow and, and, and gain power. Of course, I focus on my, my own work. I focus on the way that they manipulate language so that they sound like they're selling a more beneficial product than the real one that they're selling, which is not very good. Um, so it all sounds good on paper, too, if you want to add one more layer. Oh, we're, we're looking for social justice. We're against racism. You know, we, we just want to, to create a more fair and just society. We want more diversity. Inclusion is important to us. Nobody's quite sure what equity is, but we're for that. And equity sounds good. It's kind of like equality. We want that. Yeah, OK, good. And so they have this whole like linguistic structure where it sounds like they're selling a very palatable, nice product that just isn't. So, again, the incentive structures for criticizing it are completely pointed in the wrong direction so nobody's done so and now of course they're justifying burning down cities in response to it so maybe the incentives are going to come around a bit um but up until now there just hasn't been a proper incentive to clean up scholarship clean up teaching or or you know make sure that we're not training all of our cultural production outlets again media education faith uh arts to be activists at the same time um, when the, the one thing that I'm struggling with is that, you know, you ha as you pointed out, they have nice language. We want inclusion. We want, you know, um, you know, um, equality or so, which is great. But the hornet's nest that you put in eloquently, which is, you know, it's a very good, you know, um, uh, way of portraying it. That hornet's nest won't achieve any of those nice things that they said. I mean, no, it won't. It gets that, every issue backwards. It has nothing to do with that. So um, at the same time, you know, even I'm, I, mean, I could be convinced that, yes, we need some more equality. And, and I say, what's wrong with that? But I would want someone to come up with a, some kind of a solution that we can think about it and, and, and measure it and see what are the consequences, possibilities, feasibility, stuff like that. But when it's come to some kind of a revolution and wave, it's not it's not even um, um, it's not even serving its own purpose. That's what I'm what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's right. It, it gets every single issue that it tries to take up backwards. And in fact, when you if you were to do a careful analysis of it, it would start to reveal that it say we'll just stick to critical race theory and say Black Lives Matter. It's not elevating black people as a kind of, I mean, they would say the black community or something like this, but they never quite specify who that is. And if you actually were to do an analysis, you'd probably find out that it is a particularly uh, uh, either aggrieved or elite five to 10 percent of black people in general that it, whose interest it actually serves. Um, 
the people who are selling the diversity trainings in particular. Uh, it, it doesn't help because it gets the issue of race wrong. Uh, if you just use that one, but we could do it with any of them, with queer theory, with post-colonial theory, with fat studies, any of them, it does it, they get it backwards. Whatever it's backwards, it gets backwards. And so with race, their argument begins 400 years ago with the definition of, of race that was that came about in the West. Before that, people were kind of confused. You know, they obviously saw that people had different skin color, hair, different hair texture, different eye color, you know, different features. They obviously saw this. People weren't, you know, there's documents all the way back to the Han Dynasty talking about how they believed that European people looked like they were, they were clearly descended from monkeys. And I mean, this third century Han Dynasty saying that. So people saw a difference. It was, it was a thing, but nobody knew how it worked. Nobody who had the slightest idea how heritability worked. So heritability came into the scene in Europe in the, in, in the 16th and 17th centuries. And so now all of a sudden they constructed this idea of race in terms of, you know, you're descended from your parents and you're similar to your parents. And so, oh, well, now there's these kind of populations of people and it's something to do with who they actually are intrinsically. And at the same time, Europe was starting its, its colonialism and its effort for global conquest with the backing of things like cannons and proper guns and weaponry that, and, and of course disease that the world wasn't ready to reckon with. So they were able to do conquest because they were the first ones to figure out, not in this case, the bomb, but steel. And the first ones to figure out gunpowder, like properly figure them out, which gave them tremendous military advantages, tremendous economic advantages were, were also present because of their manipulations of mathematics that they they saved actually from the collapse of the Middle East, which had saved it from the collapse of the Greeks, which, had, you know, you can you, there's this whole interesting history there that gets lost. So race was invented to subjugate certain people to justify these colonial acts to justify taking over the barbarous people and bringing them civilization and culture to justify these the slave trade oh well we're superior so we can enslave you at first it would have been a religious but then oh well you're christian too well you're still inferior because of your race so you had this idea of investing racial categories with social significance that justified white people being on top or european people being on top in general and everybody else being beneath them and then Liberal ethics have chipped away at that slowly and painfully for three or four centuries since we finally get abolition of slavery in the 1850s and 60s across the West. We, we get, you know, genuine civil rights going through the first half of the 20th century. It takes the longest in, in the United States to 1965 or four, I guess, for the Civil Rights Act. There's still obvious racism even stretching into the 1980s and 1990s, especially across the South where I've grew up. Uh, so I, I, so I witnessed this, I know it's the case. Um, so it's not been a, like an immediate process, but we have very successfully used liberalism, universal humanity, you know, the, the, we all bleed red. I, I know in the South, it's very popular to say racism is easy to explain. Here's a white egg, here's a brown egg and they crack them both. And then the yolks are the same. It's the same inside, different outside. You know, it's, it's we've chipped away at that. We've taken racial significance out of those categories. And then he, along comes critical race theory with literally an identity first um, politic that it brought in from the radical new left activism of the 1960s. And they say there's a fundamental difference between the statement, I am black with a capital B, and I am a person who happens to be black. And they say that there's political importance and political meaning and political utility to assigning a black political identity and that you have to do identity politics from there. So now they're trying to put racial significance back in to these categories. And so you have this, this really weird theory, critical race theory, for example, and like I said, it works with all of these, uh, where they acknowledge that the problem was that significant, social significance was placed into racial categories. They acknowledge that it started to go away, and then they say, no, we need to put it back in in order to fix the problem, but it's the source of the problem, which is why you see these very popular memes now where they'll show um, kind of the social justice character. Maybe they use Robin D'Angelo's image. Maybe they they um, have a cartoon, of you know, very stereotypical picture of, of one. And then they also have somebody in the Ku Klux Klan, you know, Klan robes. And then they have them saying the same thing about white supremacy is baked into our culture. The white race is inherently superior. And it's just like, 
they've recreated the conditions that we've just spent 400 years getting away from uh, because they get it, they get everything backwards. And like I said, it applies to every single theory. Queer theory, for example, just to touch on it so you can see that I'm not exaggerating, uh, queer theory believes that the problem, that there's a problem with believing that people are inherently in some sex, gender, or sexuality category. So that turns out though, to like if the, the message that, that moved gay rights forward was some people are born gay, get over it. And then they're saying, you know, that categorizing people to according to the biology is a violence. They call it a literal violence of categorization. So you can't categorize people according to their biology, but that's what led to people recognizing equal rights for sexual minorities. So it's exactly backwards. Post-colonial theory is supposed to say, it, it, it says, oh, well, the West constructed the East as a foil to say, oh, look how cultured and great we are and how stupid and barbarous and superstitious they are. And so now they say, now post-colonial theory reconstructs the East and the West, and also the global South, uh, as saying, "Oh, we're the victims of this great and powerful, uh, this great and powerful West, and we were we were just noble savages who got taken over by." And it's like you're doing exactly the thing. They get it all backwards. Every single thing they get backwards. It's amazing, and they wonder why the problems. It's so it can't possibly serve the interests that they claim to be be claiming that it serves. But it is identifiable who it's serving, is the people hustling with it and pushing it, um, whether those people are honest or whether they happen to be dishonest, because you can't tell. It's all down to subjective experience and claims of subjective experience. So anybody, like I say it all the time, if I were just to make a Twitter account where I have a black woman as my picture and like put the wording right with my bio, I could dominate the world if just pretending to be a black woman hustling all this. Well, how many people on Twitter are you know, trolls or bots or foreign agents literally pretending to be black women hustling the system? How many people are just trying to, you know, claim the fact that they have this racial identity and then, oh, I'm so oppressed so that they can get promotions and jobs? For every person who's really being, you know, disadvantaged or disenfranchised, they are really ripping those people off. And the people who are going to play this game to win get to cheat. One of the problems that I have with the hype of um, Twitter, as you put it, um, is that I don't think responsible people uh, who are actually uh, working hard, trying hard, taking care of their family, I don't think they have time to be on social media. That's what I don't buy even this conversation that is going on Twitter as a, you know, I know, I know many people, you know, hardworking, they have, you know, working two jobs, going night school, uh, taking, you know, they, taking care of kids. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I work two jobs. I have two children with special needs. I really, I don't even have time to share some of this on, on social media, let alone go alone and, 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 and yeah, see yeah. what's going on. So I, I don't think this, you know, people uh, actually are represented in the social media or, or mainstream media for that matter. That's so that, right. I, that is why it's not even, the message is not even genuine. I, I, I think if you right. actually track down those people who, you know, um, um, you know in, in some ways are, you know, uh, I, every, they, someone might they think, you know, they are disadvantaged or, or, or underprivileged or so, even if, if, if you find them, I don't think they will uh, submit to this kind of conversation that going on in social media and mainstream media on their behalf. Right, right. So, for example, within kind of the intersection of of this critical race analysis and the queer theory analysis, you have this one particular idea. So, in in Hispanic culture, you often have people that are, you know, they they have a very gendered. Spanish is a gendered language, so you have Latinos that are male and Latinas who are female, and so these these kind of simultaneously race and queer activists have decided that that's a gross injustice. It's a violence of categorization to say, oh, you're Latino or you're Latina. So they've invented this new term that you can't even pronounce, Latin X. And I, I don't know how you say it. And from what I understand, it is less than 2% of Latinos and Latinas support the use of Latin X. They just it's it's such a tiny fraction but the the group who do so and this is what's crucial to understand and this is how it's it's succeeding the group who do so are very active they're very loud they're constantly posting um 
they are not working class people who are working two jobs and taking care of two children who have special needs. They're people who have lots of free time, and this is how they fill their 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 void in their lives is doing hashtag activism on social media. But more importantly, I've described this movement in the past as a Trojan horse. Well, a Trojan horse is relatively small. It doesn't hold that many people. I mean, it's a big wooden horse, but it maybe holds a dozen people or something. And if you follow the story, and so they let the horse in, and in the story, it's full of assassins who creep out and they kill the guards and open the gates. So you could think of it that way. But in, in reality, these there are relatively few of these people. But what they actually are are doing is they they come out of the horse and they fill administrative and bureaucratic roles where they get to start setting policy for everybody. So your working class person who's working two jobs and doesn't have time for this nonsense. Uh, I guarantee you that the uh, middle level manager at their office who is having to go through all these trainings is is like, you know, th either that person themselves or the person doing those trainings to teach them how to bring this into the office is one of these activists who has time to do it. So you don't need very many people. And I've heard this from a story, uh, the Law Society in, in Ontario, in Canada, it was a very small group of people. I guess this law society has something like 40 elected members to it, and they were pushing all this strong social justice ideology, diversity, equity statements uh, being compelled and all of this other stuff. And so one individual with a handful, I guess it was two or three individuals, but one individual spearheaded it with two or three helpers, and they put together a campaign and they ran people for positions in that body. And in one single election, they were able to get enough people opposed to the ideology, elected to that body to turn around the whole thing in just one single election. It's, it's a relatively small number of people who very consistently show up. If you're trained to be an activist in your collegiate uh, education, you're going to be trained. Well, what do you do as an activist? Well, you go on social media, you create materials, you, you have to educate people, but you also have to show up, join the board, join the school board. So you with two jobs, you don't have time to join the school board. But these people do. They these people. We see the ones in New York City. That these kind of like uh, it's now being exposed. You know, kind of middle-aged stay-at-home moms who have plenty of free time, and they're joining the school board and then you know screaming about how everybody has all these race problems and pushing this activism into the schools. But they're not the people with two jobs. They're not the people who who are, are working. But they are now administrators. So there's this bias toward people who have the time to invest into this kind of very frankly, bourgeois and elite uh, academic activism for them to start taking roles in school boards, parent, you know, what are the PTAs, uh, administrative roles, taking a, you know, like you're an admin, you're in a, you have an academic job, but you're one of these kind of activist people. Are you going to be on the committee? Of course, you're going to be on the committee. You're the first person who signs up for the committee to change hiring practices in your department. And so it's a relatively, or at least up until recently, it's been a relatively small number of activists with a relatively, I would guess somewhere between 10 to 15% of a sympathetic audience who have taken some of these ideas but don't really know them, and then everybody else who's just too busy to be bothered with it. And that actually turns out to be enough to flip an organization over. And once the policy changes, everybody's stuck. The other the other thing that comes to mind when I, when I see this movement uh, is that the, the amount of anger they generate I mean, I understand about the message and what they're trying to, but the anger they're 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 you know generating. It's um, I, I I don't I don't I don't see you know serve them in any good way. Uh, for example, I it's clearly sometimes this middle-aged women uh, that you said that they are serving in school boards now. Um, they're after, in French Revolution, I think they they started killing up uh, because they were in a killing spirit. They started killing lots of uh, uh, physicians and, and medical doctors because they were bourgeois. But at the same time, they found out later that they need those people because you know they love dependent on it. But they were yeah. they were all gone, so they had a terrible time with the health and um, uh, yeah. issues that came up. So the anger that they generating, um, uh, it, it that's the part that really really worries me. Yes. And I don't think it has anything to serve in their purpose. Yeah, I think um, actually Mao learned the same lessons the hard way. I mean, one of his favorite famous campaigns of the Cultural Revolution was to beat beat away the four olds. And so I, I, I practice martial arts, so I happen to know the story. In fact, I practice a Chinese martial art. So I know the story of what happened to the Chinese martial arts 
pretty closely. And one of the things that Mao did, because it was one of the old, it was traditional culture, was he rounded up and chased off all of the traditional martial artists in China, or he drove them out of the country or killed them or drove them underground or whatever. And very few remained who knew anything. Four or five years later, he realized it would be a great Chinese economy stunt to, oh, look at our Chinese culture. We can sell to everybody. So he's like, let's bring it all back. And the void was filled by all of these fraudsters who were wearing, you know, silk pajamas and doing silly stuff and, you know, pretty but silly stuff. Or people who were literally kind of like street magicians who started claiming they had all these magic powers that don't exist and were fooling people. And the entire thing just went went in the hole. And this, of course, happened with doctors. It happened with engineers. Very famously, it happened where they tried to take the farmers and turned them all into steel workers in the Great Leap Forward. And then they everybody starved. And they just had low quality like pig iron instead of steel. It was just a really bad mistake. Um, I could tell stories about Mao's errors along these lines to the end of the like for the whole time we talk. And and we're kind of seeing that that repeated. Um, and you are right. There's this 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 kind of blind anger that they're generating because they are. I think two reasons. One is that they're, they're so motivated by the problems, so afraid of of the horrors of the problems that they believe they're correcting. They've been whipped up into this, this these kind of false narratives about about how bad things actually are for um, these various groups of people. You know, trans people are being murdered every day, and it's black people are being killed by police every day. And you know, you hear these very gruesome things, and you see these. You know the the video of George Floyd being killed is is horrible, and it puts it puts truth to that that narrative that that kind of exaggerates it, and it, it whips up emotional responses. Secondly, this theory is is just transparently poor. It just you can see straight through it, and so when you you don't have the the facts, you don't have evidence, you don't have reason, you don't have logic on your side. You just have a narrative that people can see straight through. You have to fill that gap, that argumentative gap somehow. They don't even have sophisticated rhetoric all that much anymore. They just mostly have raw emotion, and they're filling it with with anger um, and frustration. They they see a problem, even though it's wildly exaggerated. And they are extraordinarily frustrated that they can't give examples of it. They can't give proof of it. And that they're extraordinarily angry about the fact that they can't communicate this to people who they feel like need to do something about it right now and be on the same side as they are and confirm what they feel and see. And it's a very frustrating experience. So it just generates a spiral of anger. And for many people watching, righteous indignation appears to be very righteous. So it lures more people in to believe, wow, anybody that mad must really understand how bad something is. We've heard the phrase too, laying the tracks for this. If you're if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. I've heard that a thousand times in the last 15 years. If you're not if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. So everybody who's angry must know something. They must be paying attention. They must know what's going on. So it, it, it lures people into this kind of belief that there's more there than there is, which is then backed up by having very high flute and academic language. And it's, I say, oh, you're a racist. And you're like, I'm not a racist. I've never discriminated against anybody. And you're like, you don't even know that it's a system of racism. You know, you can immediately get into that. You don't even understand the definition of racism. And so all of a sudden you can get people feeling clumsy and uncomfortable. And then there, people watching this are thinking, wow, that person must actually know something. And the other person doesn't even know the definition. And it, there's this whole spiral in which the vacuum of substance can be filled with emotion and then be very convincing to people. Um, and it's exciting to get involved in something kind of wild too, right? Especially with younger people, especially younger men. Um, it's, it's fun and exciting to go riot and knock statues down and carry on when you're a 23 year old guy who doesn't know what he's doing in the world. Um, I, 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 from time to time, I try to have conversation with these people or at least be present in what they are discussing or so. Um, here's my um, actual observation. I, I've never seen any of them who've done anything. You know, they're, they're talk about, you know, things that, you know, they read or, or heard somewhere. But I, I ask them, have you ever worked in any environment that you see this? Uh, have you ever you know, done anything in your life? Well, you know, have you spent a year or two in any kind of, I don't know, uh, factory, uh, manufacturing, uh, any kind of, you know, workforce, the real workforce, not sitting in, in front of your phone or computer and, and clicking and, and not that, but the actual work. And almost 
you know, none of these people have ever done anything. They're just, you know, they're just consuming whatever they see on the screen and they think it's real. Um, so uh, I, I have no idea what kind of education even they are getting. Uh, I have no idea what they are trying to achieve because even if you give them anything in a blanket right now, you know, white blank check, you know, just everything for you, what do you want to do? They have no idea even to run a simple thing that they are trying to fix. Right, right. And I, I actually resonate with that. I almost started to say that a minute ago. I resonate with that argument that they've done so little. Um, for me, I, I saw it particularly with the with the responses to people doing looting and rioting and burning buildings down and, and things like that. And anybody who has built something up from, you know, relatively little, they've worked their way up in a company even, or they've built their own company, or they've they've established a home and built up, you know, the, the, the property ownership and paying off your house. They've helped to raise a child, you know, hopefully in a, in a, you know, stable nuclear family household. Like anybody who's built something in, in life and who's really bounced their, their lives off of reality, a hole and building something with it, um, with the mud, Anybody who's built something that they can be proud of is horrified by the idea that some lawless vandal is going to be able to come along and destroy it, and then there's no recompense for that. There's no, there's nothing there to stop it. The police won't stop it. Somebody's bailing them out of jail. Anybody who's actually built something with their lives um, is horrified by that. And there is, that, in that sense, another cause for this anger that I, you know, I hate to judge at people's motivations, but envy is always just a scratch beneath the surface in this. I think, in fact, in particular, what we've seen is with so many people going to college and getting educated, we have a number of people, we have actually more elites than our society has positions for. So you have a kind of a oversaturation of people who believe themselves to be part of the elite and there are no meaningful jobs for those people. Um, I know for myself, you know, I got a PhD and I found it very hard to not have some high story academic job when I finally left the university. It took some real soul searching to say, no, you know what, I'm not above labor. I'm not above getting a regular job and it's hard. And um, there are only so many people who get to be, in a sense, the artists. There are only so many people, an economy can only support so much of that. Uh, and so there aren't tons of positions. And so there is an envy that people who are out there doing real work, you know, get, this, get, get these various positions that they've worked their way into. Whereas, you know, why not me? My friend is an engineer in Alaska. And he, he works on, he's a senior engineer, he's, you know, near the end of his career, and he builds docks and barges, you know, whatever important things are, are involved in, you know, Alaska is not a stable, safe, easygoing environment, right? Nature is rough there. And so he's 35, 40 years in engineering, he's a project manager, et cetera, and he has all these kids coming a year out of college, and they're like, well, I want to be a project manager. And he's like, kid, I, I don't know what to tell you. You need experience. And they're like, no, I went to college. I'm ready to be a project manager. He says, no, you need experience. And they said, well, you're just trying to keep it from me. He told me, he said, that these kids are like, you just don't want us to be project managers yet. And he said he took one of these kids aside and he said, look, if I could make you a project manager tomorrow and you could do the job, I would do it. It's not about that. It's that you actually have to gain the experience. You have to build the the resume to have that role and then we're in a situation where if you get it wrong people are going to die we're talking bridges and docks across the alaskan ocean um so i can't just give it to you and then they just accused him of you know hoarding the keys to the castle to himself and not being willing to share them and so there's this weird you know under accomplished entitlement that's somehow getting funneled into the the system where the you know kids are getting a college degree and good for them and engineering excellent that's a that's a strong field we need a lot of engineers and yet they still have this belief that oh one year out of college and i should be the one designing the whole project and heading up the team and obviously having the high status and the high high pay and everything else and no desire to work their way up into anything so something has gone badly wrong there uh and I'm sure it's a confluence of, of many forces, but it definitely contributes to this this attitude. So when you look at that now with people who just have some degree in cultural production of some time, journalism, art, education, uh, history, or something like this, 
and there's no jobs for them. You know, there's only, I remember when I was a kid, or as I was in college, a, a friend of mine wanted to major in history, and he was told you probably shouldn't major in history unless you're absolutely sure that you're going to dedicate yourself to this at the highest level, because in any given year, there are only however many hundred jobs opened up in history. And so we can't just give, you know, encourage people to get doctorates in history across the board because there just aren't enough jobs. And then that's all changed in 20 years. So we have a lot of... Uh, unplaced and disgruntled uh, people with very elite attitudes. And I don't know what else. I mean, that's that, that's most of who's doing a lot of this highly educated complaining, it seems. This is a fascinating conversation, and I think we can can go it on for a couple of hours, but I, <laughs> I promise you to keep it about an hour. I'll try to have just two questions, so maybe we can uh, we can end it. Uh, one, you touched upon something that um, I'm, it's very close to my heart. I'm following it too. The use of the language uh, and the terminology that they're using. Um, this this is something that baffles me all the time. For example, they call themselves progressives, uh, but whatever they do has nothing to do with progress at all. I mean, like it's it, it, even in their in the mandate uh, or or the platform that they are trying to present. There's no progress. Uh, I think, you know, from if you if you look at it, you know, objectively, um, Edward Jenner, you know, invented vaccination, made a real progress in life. He was progressive because he changed life, you know, yeah. you know for the better things. Uh, but this this kind of resentment uh, slash envy uh, slash anger, uh, what part of it is progress that, you know, even I cannot understand what why they call themselves progressives? They have. As, as you've noted, they changed the understanding of what constitutes progress for themselves. So for them, progress, I mean, you really do have to understand some of the philosophical history to understand it, but it means achieving liberation from any kind of systemic oppression. The, the, the less systemic oppression there is in terms of these kind of very superficial, you know, social categories, the less social stratification there is, the more progress has been achieved. So when you have a completely socioeconomically equal society, that's progress. So they've redefined progress to mean that there's no such thing as anything that can create systemic oppression, in particular for the groups that have been historically marginalized. So there's a historical element to this. That way they can keep, keep running the same hustle no matter what happens. Um, so progress means creating something like ethnic communism that makes up for all the the sins of the past and i say ethnic but it's really you know sex gender sexuality all of the identity factors come into play so they want something that progress for them means something that makes up for and reverses the systemic oppressions of of history rather than you know creating vaccines or or something that creates genuine human progress um Last thing I wanted to ask, I was reading um, some time ago, uh, Jim Prozer wrote a book on Jordan Peterson. It's called Savage Messiah. One part of it, you know, I, I don't much have a you know, conspiracy theory person. I, I, I don't give into that I, unless there are, you know, huge amount of, you know, accurate, um, um, verifying to think about it. I, I think it's very complex and complicated. But he, um, he's just mentioning a KGB uh, defector guy. To Canada, and it says we need two or three generations to poison a society. Mm -hmm. And what what he says is that we just start with the universities, and we print some, uh, we we just seed some ideas of the you know left social you know equality or so. And doesn't matter in next 20 to 30 years, some of these people, half of these people, are taking place someplace in the government, and they are doing exactly what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not. It's hard for me to go to that touch, but everything I see points to that direction. Do you see some kind of a outside hand in this whole process that we're going through now? I would say that the process that we are going through is very susceptible to at least small manipulations by an outside hand. But I wouldn't give the KGB quite that much credit. Um, these movements were happening. Uh, I would doubt they they were intentionally cooked up by the KGB and then fed to the French and you know these theorists in both Germany and France and you know like maybe I don't know but uh, more likely what's been going on because you have this one particular 
you have many people over generations operating in the same line of thought. So you have this one particular communist philosopher in the 1920s named Antonio Gramsci. And Antonio Gramsci outlined a program to be at Columbia University and at Berkeley and so on. And it was then translated properly into English in 1970. Um, and it became kind of part of the thing where the violence of the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s was realized that it was getting diminishing results. Nobody was particularly happy with these radical weather underground people trying to blow up buildings and, and causing these race riots, you know, the different, uh, you know, liberation politics people. And so the violence gave way and the long march to the institutions very explicitly in the 1970s, they started to move into the, to the universities. It's, this could have been nudged or even encouraged by the Soviets, but it didn't need to be. So the the, the statement for me would be that uh, this thing was happening and it would be very open to outside manipulation. And anybody with half a brain cell functioning would figure out that malevolent foreign actors would take advantage of such a thing if they saw it. So it probably did have some of that going on. For example, even if we move to the very present, um, you know, many people have noticed that uh, a very large amount of, of activism and well-produced materials started to flow within literally days of George Floyd's killing, pushing in this direction. And they think, oh, it was a conspiracy, you know, that maybe maybe it was even rigged up. You know, you, the conspiracy theorists start doing all this crazy thinking. But it's much more reasonable to, to just acknowledge that there are, are a large number of left wing think tanks besides the universities, which have become de facto left wing think tanks, leftist, I should say, not left wing. And these these left wing or leftist think tanks which we could name if we wanted to, London School of Economics, Open Society Foundation, you could just go down the list and start naming many of these things, uh, would constantly be producing these kinds of materials anyway. They're not Kimberly even trained on themselves leftists, so, and there's no problem calling them leftists. Right, right, right. And so so these, these think tanks would be producing these kinds of materials, just like on the right you have their think tanks and they're producing materials. The statement, never let a crisis go to waste. So the instant came and then they said, that this is it. Then we flood the market with the stuff that they've been producing. But it doesn't mean that there was a conspiracy to produce the event. The event will occur eventually anyway. And to call, is that a conspiracy? No, it's, I mean, it's, it's think tanks doing what think tanks do and then seizing a moment to, to push an agenda. But from the outside, it looks very coordinated if you're given to conspiratorial thinking. So... Again, this is a kind of movement that is very open to that kind of manipulation. But it's, I think, giving, I think it's giving um, people who don't deserve it far too much credit to say that they probably, you know, conspired and produced this whole thing. You know, the the KGB defector saying, well, this is a thing. Well, I mean, Antonio Gramsci was writing that down in the 1920s. So maybe the Soviets knew it. Maybe the Soviets were using it. They probably would have. Uh what percentage of the effect is down to that? Some, but not zero probably, but certainly not 100. Um, so I think that you, within the context of broad movements like this, you have lots of room for, for conspiratorial hands to come into play, but the, the conspiratorial hand is not like some all-powerful agent that's, that's pulling all the strings and making it happen. So there's some truth to the conspiracy, but it's not the truth of the story, if that makes any sense. Um, it does, but uh, again, it's a very complicated issue that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I won't, I, I won't take much of your time because I promised not to take more than an hour. But I want you to promise me come back for two sessions at least, because I wanted to okay. start this and going back to ideas that what we should do from now or what we, sh what the message should be. I think at least one session talk about that. And at the same time, I ordered your book. I haven't received it yet, so I would like that book arri arrives soon, and I read it, and you and I would talk about that book as well. So you have to promise Excellent. to come back so for have uh, another two sessions with ourselves. Uh, I'm happy to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being on Marianne West.